Thank you all so much for being here. I'm a New Orleans girl myself who um, studied politics and left Washington and had a career in journalism myself as the executive producer for many years of Meet the Press with Tim Russert. I'm now uh, on the faculty at American University uh, where I teach campaigns and elections and run an institute on women in politics. And it's a great pleasure to have my friends and former colleagues with us today. I um, want to introduce them to you uh, and their terrific books. Uh, Katie Turr, um, to my left here, is of course a correspondent at NBC News. Uh, and she anchors the daily Katie Turr Reports, aptly named, on MSNBC. Uh, she is the author of two books. Uh, the first one came out after her coverage of the 2016 campaign, and we can talk a little bit about that. Um, it's called Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> My good front book. row seat to the craziest campaign in America, also after <laughs> named. And then uh, she is just out um, recently with her uh, latest book, Rough Draft, a memoir, where she um, talks about uh, growing up as the uh, child of two journalism journalist parents and her career uh, chasing the stories all around the world. So, uh, Katie, thank you for being here. Thank you. <laughs> Ali Vitali is also at NBC News. Uh, she is the Capitol Hill correspondent. Uh, she is also the veteran of covering the 2016 campaign and the 2020 campaign. And she is the author uh, of a book um, called Electable, Why America Hasn't Put a Woman in the White House, dot, 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 yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Allie, for being here. Thanks. And playing the role of Maggie Haberman. <laughs> I'm we, just going to read my answers from her book. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to, it's going to be a book reading on my answers. We have my good friend and uh, lifesaver here uh, this morning, John Dickerson. Um, he, of course, is a senior political analyst at CBS News, and he hosts a show, again aptly named, Primetime with John Dickerson, on the CBS streaming network. He is, of course, uh, the former moderator of my old competition, Face the Nation, and uh, also the former co-host of CBS This Morning. He has a long career in journalism, started in print journalism. He, of course, wrote for many years at Slate Magazine uh, and then for Time Magazine. So thank you for being here, John. As a former TV producer, you sometimes do have guests that drop out at the last minute, and you always look to your friends to save you. So again, thanks again, John. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to start, as we kind of go inside politics and talk about the campaign, just to take a look at what's going on this weekend. We have Ron DeSantis, who is in Iowa on a book tour, uh, taking um, shots at Fauci, right? Uh, we have Trump going to Iowa on Monday. We have Mike Pence uh, headlining the Gridiron Dinner tonight in Washington. For those of you who don't know that dinner, it's uh, an opportunity to kind of, where politicians stand up and roast each other. And so he's gonna try his hand at humor tonight. <laughs> so we see things starting to take shape. Are we seeing a new, a new kind of Mike Pence? Um, but I thought we'd just go down the line uh, at the beginning and just get your insights on how you see this landscape right now developing for 2024, which, by the way, the election is 605 days away from today. <laughs> it's never too That's early. That's going to go by in a snap. <laughs> never too early to start talking about these kind of things. Um, but in this chair, for any of you that were here this morning and heard James Carville right out of the bat say, he thought that Trump was definitely going to be the nominee. Um, Katie, lead us off and, and give us the, how you see the landscape right Ron now. Ron DeSantis on his book tour. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, there's a law in Florida that, that's called uh, resign to run. So in order for him to run for president, as of now, he has to resign the governorship. He's not going to do that. They might, they might repeal the law. That's currently on the table, which would allow him to do both at the same time. Um, I think it's going to get 
ugly. It could potentially get really ugly in the Republican primary in the coming months as both DeSantis and Trump jockey for front position. I mean, it's early. Anyone else could potentially come out of the woodwork, but right now those are the two juggernauts in the race. Donald Trump's base of support doesn't go anywhere. So for them to move to DeSantis will take a, a Herculean move, something like, I don't know, Donald Trump getting indicted and, indicted and put in prison, potentially. Um, but I wouldn't hold my breath for that. Uh, the question I have is if Ron DeSantis is able to move past Donald Trump in the Republican primary, and that is still a big if, is he a winning candidate in the general election? I asked this on my show the other day. I was butchering Shakespeare. Um, does, uh, what did I say, does uh, Donald Trump by any other name yeah. <laughs> win back the White House? Because he is so Trump-like in his policies, and we've seen now in 2018, 2020, and 2022 that those divisive policies and, and candidates who run on a MAGA agenda in competitive races have lost, by and large. Donald Trump lost the, the general election in 2020. Democrats won Congress in 2018. They, they almost kept a hold of the House in 2022. So Ron DeSantis might be a more buttoned up Donald Trump without all the palace intrigue, which is what he says. Right. Um, but are his policies palatable for the American public at large, or will they then look again to someone like Joe Biden that has a, I mean, I dare I use this, more of a unifying force? Right. And as we look at sort of the primary field taking shape, Ali, let me ask you, because we've got, you know, a lot of these candidates, the, the more candidates that are running against Trump, the more likely Trump is to be the yeah. nominee. That's how he one in 2016, uh, a large field is his friend. And so there is this you know, vying for who is gonna be the Trump alternative. I mentioned Mike Pence, you recently did an interview with him. Yeah, very good Tell one. us about that and how you see him trying to maneuver in. Well, look, I mean, they're all gonna have a really awkward time of it going forward because Nikki Haley served in the Trump administration, Mike Pompeo served in the Trump administration, Certainly Mike Pence served in the Trump administration. He was the vice president, right? So yeah. all of these people are gonna have to figure out a way to go at Trump without going at Trump because by criticizing the administration, they're criticizing themselves, right? So Nikki Haley is trying to say that it's a generational argument and Mike Pompeo hasn't quite formulated his thing yet, but I'm sure in the next six weeks we'll see it. For Mike Pence, what he did in this interview with me and what he's been saying recently, is he's making a style argument and saying, we need someone with civility and who respects the voter. And certainly civility is not a word that even Republican voters that like Trump, we've never heard them say, oh, he's just highly civil and that's why I like him. But like, it's not a thing. <laughs> so Pence can make that argument and we'll see. I think as I talk to my sources, people who are working with candidates that might get in, who are definitely getting in, they talk about what Katie's talking about, which is like Trump commands 30x percent, between 20 and 30 percent of the voting Republican primary base. So other candidates are trying to figure out, okay, do I peel them off because they're sick of Trump? Do I peel them off because they don't like the election denialism? And all of that is untested right now. And you're not even doing it in a national lens, though I think the national landscape is important. You're doing it in places like Iowa and New Hampshire that are in, in some ways more conservative than battleground states like Arizona and Georgia. So you're testing it in a much smaller way too. Right. So for Pence and others, I mean, it's just gonna be really awkward. And I, I don't think you can be too cute by half. You have to at some point say Trump's name and why you think you'd be a better president than him. Yeah, go ahead, John. I, I'll just pick up there. Yeah. Um, this is a deeply, deeply, deeply weird election. And for this reason, <laughs> We're talking about Iowa, we're talking about positioning with the different constituencies, and it's like we're looking at a chess match, and we're looking at the normal chess match, and we're saying, rook takes pawn four, okay, that's the normal way it works, except the chess match is taking place on the Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> Donald Trump, there are three obligations of the presidency. You have to be 35, born in the United States, and have lived here for 14 years. But at least one implicit requirement of the presidency is that you don't need to have been actively engaged in trying to overthrow the U.S. government and, and overthrow a, an election. A lot of times elections are, are, are talked about as job interviews. You would not interview a person to drive a bus for kindergartners who had been the only person 
to ever hold the job who actively tried to drive a bus with kindergartners off a cliff. <laughs> so that's what's taking place. And these, these judgments about Donald Trump having tried to do this are not my opinions. These are the three top Republicans in the party, Mike Pence, Mitch McConnell, Kevin McCarthy, all said Donald Trump, by the major requirement of the job, which is to protect and defend the Constitution, that he failed. And he didn't just fail on the 6th of January. He spent several months trying every possible way he could to undermine a free and fair election, which is, of course, goes right at the heart of his job, which is to protect the Constitution. And he did everything he could to not do that job. So it seems odd that you would want to rehire him to not do the job he successfully didn't do, perhaps more successfully than any previous president. And yet we have, we're having a presidential campaign in which he is the front runner and is likely to get the Republican nomination. And, and it didn't just stop, by the way, at January 6th. One of the things Kevin McCarthy, the Speaker of the House, the top Republican in the House said was that Donald Trump continued to fail at his duty by not preparing the government for Joe Biden to come take the job. When presidential transitions are incredibly important. The presidency is not like an Airbnb. You don't just check in and check out. Or if it's like an Airbnb, you have to rebuild the Airbnb every time you come into it. And the previous president owes an obligation to his person who comes after him. George W. Bush did this beautifully for Barack Obama, and Barack Obama did it for Donald Trump. Donald Trump and his team actively worked against Joe Biden coming in, which is not about Joe Biden. It's about us and the office of the presidency. And so it was, it, Donald Trump's efforts to undermine his office didn't just start right after election night. It continued all the way up to the inauguration. That's what's taking place in the Republican primary right now. You have the front runner who's likely to get the nomination, somebody who is totally antithetical to the job they're trying to hire him for. We've never had that before. So. Well, the question well, I think then is, what does it mean about for the, I mean, the people who will elect him to that position? What does it say about the GOP primary electorate that they're willing to put that person back yeah. into yeah. that, that yeah, look at the driver's ranks seat of Republican of the congressmen, the people who I hang out with all the time, who you guys are always interviewing, you have more election deniers serving in Congress right now. I mean, he's remade the party in a mold where there's either a turning a blind eye to it or like a, yeah, I mean, like we probably just shouldn't talk about election denialism, but like the polling that you guys just put out, yeah. that 45% of Republican women voters don't trust the results of national elections. It's less a referendum on like the standard political issues that we talk about and more like, hey, democracy, you a fan or not? Like that is kind of the stake of right. this. Right, and you know, we've alluded to the investigations and if, if we do have indictments and charges coming for us, does that galvanize his base even more? I think it does galvanize um, his hardcore supporters yeah. who believe that he's been unfairly treated. And that's fine. They can go on believing that, and Donald Trump can campaign on it. I believe that they're preparing to campaign on him being indicted. They're preparing for it to come from New York, or to come right. from Georgia, or potentially to come from Jack Smith in the special counsel's office. But that's, if you're tired of Donald Trump, and you're tired of the drama, and we saw that happen in 2020, I'm running on being indicted because I'm being unfairly targeted does not inspire a general election win. win. Right. But then if it doesn't inspire a general election win and he's going to continue saying that the election is rigged and it's unfair and continue driving home this lie that our elections are not trustworthy, and then if he has the majority of the Republican Party in, in Congress yeah. backing him saying that, do we see January 6th again? What do we see next? Right. Well, I want to ask you all to think about you know, the other side of the coin and the Democrats and what they're grappling with, right? Um, John, you alluded to, the, to asking the interview questions in a, in a campaign. A campaign is a job interview. Um, and, and you write in your book, too, about, you know, are we asking um, someone, are we looking for someone to be a good campaigner or a good president? And how does that come in when we think about Biden and a decision to run again for office, even though he'll be 82 when he would take office. Um, what is the thought process within the Democratic Party uh, now as they look at the Democratic side? Well, I think the, the thought process is we have a very old candidate and his yeah. age will be a constant problem, which he exacerbates himself in a variety of different ways. He's been a consequential president both in, uh, both on the upside and the downside. His approval ratings are not great, and um, and maybe are imp are not going to get better. Depending, especially, it may get worse if if the the chairman of the Federal Reserve in his testimony this week said things are going to get 
more bumpy than mm -hmm. he thought before. When the Federal Reserve Chairman, who is genetically designed from birth to say nothing that's going to scare people, <laughs> says the word bumpy, that's, that's, Hold a, on to your seat. that's a huge, yes, exactly. There's not going to be a soft landing. It's brace for impact. So if you're the incumbent president, regardless of the, the true fact that the economy operates kind of separate from what, I mean, largely separate from what a president does or can do, it, um, that's not great for Joe Biden. So um, it's very tough for Joe Biden. They're probably their, the biggest upside for him is if Donald Trump um, either is the nominee, which is also a downside and a challenge because Donald Trump is a formidable nominee with, in, with incredible political skills, um, or that if Donald Trump is not the nominee, that on his way out, he basically destroys the party and whoever the ultimate Takes nominee out. is. Yeah, because um, he's not one to want to lose and he's not gonna go quietly. No. By any stretch of the imagination, no, no, <laughs> right? Right. And and Ali, let me ask you because as you think and wrote a book about you know will we have our first woman president, um, Kamala Harris, the vice president, and the stakes and the some concern within the Democratic Party of whether she um, would be a formidable formidable president herself. Yeah, I mean this is I think one of the most complex and fascinating people in Washington right now. And I really, when I was writing my book, struggled with how to pull apart all mm -hmm. of the things that are layered on top of the way that we view the vice president. The fact that she is trailblazing, the fact that she's historic, she's closer than any woman has ever been to the Oval Office. That's critically important. Republicans, Democrats, everyone I spoke to for the book say, that is good for anyone who wants to see more reflective governance. Great. And also, everyone seems to say that she just falls short of expectations and she doesn't have the skills and she's not this. I mean, the woman didn't just like accidentally become vice president. It requires a pretty fair amount of experience and ambition to get to that role. She ran for president. The campaign was a mess. All of us know that. We covered it. But men have had messy campaigns and gone on to do other things. One Joe Biden comes to mind. Um, yeah. But with Kamala Harris, I think she's, she's stuck in this place where because we expect her to almost remake the role of the vice presidency simply because she looks like someone who's never held that role before puts her in direct contrast with the fact that you don't want the vice president just freelancing an entirely new job. The role of a vice president is support the president. But she's and so, been largely invisible during this administration. By design, right? Because, and, and look, we know this too. There's a lot of sensitivity within the Biden orbit about making sure that he's not overshadowed because of the ways that age can be exacerbated, because of the way that it's, there's a propensity towards the gaffes, which you know, was the whole thing during the campaign. But she has struggled by the political metrics that we use to turn that role into something where she can notch wins. And there have been people who look at it and say, how do we not, if, if Biden were to decide not to run, how do we not back the current vice president and then the concern is, but they don't think she's ready. And I think there's, there's reality to both of those things. And how does Biden lot. thread that needle if he decides not to run and Correct. he decides not to support his hand-chosen pick no. yeah. as vice president? Very difficult, right? Yeah. And, and the spotlight is on her too, right? Because of yeah. the age stuff, John. Right? Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. There's a... Um, and, you know, the job being president is very hard. Um, and so the... Um, the the, the spotlight will be on her and every live event that happens she'll be measured against, but because she's vice president, she can't speak to things, and wouldn't, you wouldn't want that. In a properly ordered presidency, the vice president's role is not to speak ahead of the president, and sometimes the, the role of the president is not to speak at all either. So yeah. it's not like, so she's, she would be in a very tough, and will be in a very tough spot, because there will be a lot of scrutiny but there is no reason either by the dictates of the office or the dictates of politics that she should speak up. But then a lot of us will come and go, boy, she's not saying anything. I would, only, I would only make unfair. one more point, which is like the issue that I think turned the midterms was reproductive access and abortion. Yeah. And Harris was very out front on that issue, going to a lot of these communities, bringing abortion providers to the White House. I think that's the, one of the first times that they've ever had that happen. She has been a really important voice in galvanizing at the grassroots level on that issue. I'm not saying that the midterms turned on Kamala Harris going and giving some speeches on abortion, but I am saying that she was one of the key leaders on that from the administration, in large part because Biden's just not super comfortable with that issue. Yeah, Katie, did you want to weigh in? Okay. No, I was just yeah. gonna say, if we're talking about uh, what would Biden do if he backed out and then was faced with whether to, to back his vice president? It's not completely analogous because there was Donald Trump in between, but Barack Obama very notably 
held back his endorsement of Joe Biden for many months during the primaries and allowed it to, to continue forward because I think he th thought that Joe Biden was not such a great candidate and was had a proclivity to, to gaffes. So there is some precedent for the president taking a step back and letting the, the system do what it will. And I wonder if that's what the White House would lean on if Joe Biden did not run for president. But all signs indicate that he is running. So this is kind of a mood, a mood discussion. If Jill says it, if the first lady says it. Right. Yeah. The age thing is <laughs> And she was here yesterday. <laughs> There was, a know, CBS, great drop yeah. there was a CBS poll a few months ago back in the fall um, about whether you believe there should be age limits for our elected officials. And it's a discussion that's surrounding not just Joe Biden, but some of our elected officials in Congress right now who are getting quite up there in age. And the vast majority of respondents said yes. I think it's over 76% said yes, there should be age limits. And the majority of the majority were people who were of the, the older section themselves. Yeah. So there is, I think there is a desire to get a lot for another generation. younger, fresher blood into the mix. And the Democratic Party is, has frankly really struggled with that over the past two decades or so, other than Barack Obama. Yeah. Right. It was always the case, even covering Bob Dole in 1996, where his age was an issue, and he's a lot younger than Joe Biden is now, yeah. where the people who would raise it out on the campaign trail ended up were people who were close to Dolan age and would say, it wasn't a new generation, they would say, I don't know, I, I don't think I could do this job with all of its requirements day to day, constantly. Um, can I just make one quick point about the Republican field, having said what I said about the deeply uh, out of body weirdness of the Republican race. It's con one other element of it is there are very strong candidates in the Republican side. I mean, look at Mike Pompeo, Secretary of State, head of the CIA. What does the president right. do? Mostly deals with foreign policy, despite the fact that we just spent a lot of time on domestic policy. A president has extraordinary influence over foreign policy. He has great uh, credentials there, and he was in Congress. Nikki Haley has foreign policy credentials. She was a governor in a low, sta low uh, tax state. She also has a, a political constituency with suburban Republican women, which is very helpful for a party where that group was bruised with Donald Trump. Mike Pence, of course, has executive experience as a governor. He's seen it from the inside as a vice president, and he's been tested in a moment where it mattered, yeah. and every possible piece of pressure on him was to do the wrong thing. He did the right thing on January 6th, which is basically used to be the only qualification for president. Has the person been tested? And Mike Pence has been tested, and in that instant, um, he succeeded. And then finally, DeSantis, you know, in Congress, successful governor, yeah. people are moving to his state like crazy. Um, these are all strong candidates if we were in a traditional world, uh, but we're not at the moment. I think there's a, an interesting question about what is the, the banking industry, what does Wall Street do with a DeSantis presidency? You had Jamie Dimon, head of JP Morgan just the other day, praising Florida and saying how great Florida is for business and how he's actively moving a lot of JP Morgan down to Florida. So if DeSantis runs, I mean, he's, if he has those divisive policies, it will put the banking industry in, in, into an interesting mm -hmm. position. They might love him for business reasons, but it might be difficult for them to support him yeah. for social reasons. Well, and he's also continuing the COVID debate that and, and look, was so but, divisive. But also, look what he's done with Disney, which is also yeah. a, a, a red flag for corporations. Right, but going after Fauci yesterday, I mean, clearly wanting to continue the you know seeds of doubt and the division over COVID policies. And I'm not sure if you're running against Donald Trump, you want the bankers on your side. Yeah. I, think Donald, I think Jamie Dimon just helped Donald Trump by saying that. Yeah, um, I would say the only thing we have, we talked about age as like a Biden problem. Yeah. It's a Trump problem too. All of those people that you just mentioned who are formidable candidates have, you know, clearly defined political profiles. None of them are septuagenarians. Yeah. I don't know, man, person, TV, camera, he got it. Yeah. <laughs> Nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even remember that order. <laughs> but I think age is going to be a way that they can go around it. The pinch point on DeSantis and Trump yeah. is on COVID. As DeSantis tries to run to the right of Trump on a lot of these things, right. Trump has to stand by the administration's COVID response. So does Mike Pence. But DeSantis is now in this place of being flimsy on vaccines, on whatever. I mean, I don't know. I think that it's he doesn't have to point. stand by anything, and he never has. And, <laughs> and if, if he wants to flip it and, and say that he just throw everybody in his administration under the bus and have it make no sense whatsoever, I think I he guess. will do that, and he'll pull the party along with him. I guess that's true. 
You're right. The, He's yeah. never been wed to anything. You're right. Yes. You're right. I mean, he contradicts himself often in the same sentence. It is I mean, amazing. There were, there were times when we were on the campaign, Ali and I both covered Did Trump we do together. that like, campaign wait, together? Did I learn anything? <laughs> <laughs> and and there, you would verbate everything he said. Ali had the task of literally writing down every single word he said God at bless. every single campaign rally. I'm fine. And she's okay. <laughs> But we would take out paragraphs, and remember, we'd look at them, and it, is this a typo? They would contra he would contradict himself yeah. repeatedly back and forth in the same paragraph. So, I mean, there's no fidelity to reality or the truth yeah. or what might have happened. It's he believes whatever he believes in the moment that he believes it, and if he changes his mind the next moment, he believes that. Go ahead, John. Can we go back just for a yeah. second to the math problem on the Republican side, which is when Larry Hogan, the former governor of Maryland, got out of the race, he said. I don't want to split the vote on the non-Trump side and have it be a four-car pileup and right. then end up electing Donald Trump, which is, of course, what happened in 2016. There were more Republican voters who voted for somebody other than Donald Trump than voted for Donald Trump in the primaries and caucuses. The, the problem for those who didn't want Donald Trump in office is that those more voters split their vote among a bunch of candidates. So this challenge exists again, um, and as I think it was Katie who was talking about, there is the, the Trump constituency is rock solid, hard, and not going anywhere. And so even if you're an attractive candidate by the credentials I laid out earlier, you have to go get two different constituencies. You can't leave Donald Trump's constituency to him entirely. You either have to grab some of those voters or weaken his support with them. Well, do it, behavior that, that tends to that account tends to bum out the rest of Republican voters who are over here who you also need to do and so for, who need to court. So any candidate having to try to take on Donald Trump and build enough votes has to ride two horses and that is really, really hard, hard to do to. and it's really hard to do if it's the first time you've ever run as a presidential candidate, which is the truth for all four of those other people I mentioned. Well, and Ali, I wanted to ask you because we're, we're talking about you know, potentially a woman president, we mentioned Nikki Haley. Um, interesting when she announced for president um, and somewhat unusual in Republican Party um, not really wanting to talk about identity politics, embracing, you know, the woman capacity there uh, and talking about, you know, running in heels. What was the joke that she made? Yeah. You kick, kick, when you, you kick, kick with heels, heels, it hurts yeah. more. Yes, like that. exactly. Um, how do you see it, her candidacy? I mean, look, I was surprised, I guess, by the fact that she invoked gender as heavily as she yes. did. Um, it's something that typically conservative voters abhor. They hate the idea that you're gonna come in and say, I am running as a woman, I am running as a person of color. That is not the way to earn voters on the Republican side of the equation. As opposed to on the Democratic side, there's much more thought and potentially overthought about the role that gender and race will play. We saw that among the six women who ran in 2020, and it's why I think you didn't end up with a female nominee, or part of why, at the top of that ticket. Gender was sort of baked in after, after 2016 and Hillary Clinton. Um, with Haley, I think on the policy is where it matters more, and it's because there's a study that I come across in my book as well where you talk about how if there's any reticence on the part of conservative voters that is about uh, gender or racial bias, it can be overcome on ideology. If you prove an ideological purity, that you are there for the policy, the way that Republicans and conservatives think about it, you're not thinking about it as a woman, as a black person, as a Hispanic person, you are only thinking about it as a Republican, you can overcome any kind of questions about if you're, if you're there for the right reasons, effectively, for any Bachelor fans that might be in the room. Um, and that, I think, yeah, I have a guilty pleasure. It's fine. <laughs> um, that, I think, is the way that she's going to toy with it. Yeah. And you watch, in the same day that she announces, talking about kicking back in heels, she goes out and she says, OK, we need to find whether it's 12 weeks, 15 weeks, whatever, on a national abortion ban. But I think right. the government should figure that out, right? So, it's there in the policy lane. I want to let you all know we're going to take questions in about a minute. So if you do have questions, please feel free uh, to come up to the microphone. But I, I just want to, um, in this part of the conversation, asking you all, as reporters who cover the campaign, we've talked so much about um, you know, the partisanship and distrust in the media and the vitriol atmosphere, um, I guess you could say, <laughs> that you all have lived through. Um, covering the campaigns. Katie, you wrote an entire book about this after 2016. Um, you all will remember um, Katie being called out by then candidate Trump at many rallies. What did he say, Katie? Little Katie? Third rate reporter. Third rate reporter. Liar. And, you know, real security issues um, came about because of that for you. And, yeah, and, definitely. And 
as you all think about going back out on the campaign trail, um, just talk a little bit about that atmosphere, the distrust of the media, and how so much of the media has been vilified um, by one part of the... I don't know about you guys. I, I feel uh, discomfort in any public venue or setting now. I mean, even sitting here, I'm sure you guys are all great. Uh, but, <laughs> no, I mean, I, 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 I do... I, I just, it, it feels like there's so much anger toward mm -hmm. us, directed by one individual and then piled on by so many others, that it, it, it doesn't feel as safe as it used to be. And, and, and that was, I mean, it was, it's always been there, but it was exacerbated in 2016. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's not just from the right, it's from the left as well. Um, this idea that we don't cover the stories that matter. I mean, I have yeah. people um, on the left yell at me for not covering X, Y, or Z, and I'll say, hey, when's the last time you watched my show? Well, I never watch your show. I'm like, well, then of course you don't know that I've covered X, Y, and Z on my show. It's just this, it's this idea, this mindset that we're not doing it even, even if they're not watching. Mm -hmm. um, Bernie Sanders perpetuates this quite a bit. He says the corporate media never wants to talk about healthcare and the corporate media never wants to talk about taxes. Or, and we talk about that, or they never, we never want to talk about him and, or talk to him about these issues. And we try to talk to him all the time. No, I know we do. And he's, yeah. he's often yeah. saying, no, I don't want to talk to you. Correct. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's perpetuated on both sides and it's, it's a problem. I mean, I'm not saying we're perfect. We make mistakes a lot um, and we have our own constraints, but we do try to own up to those mistakes. Uh, and we are as forthcoming as honest, and, and as honest as, as, as can be. And we have a lot of accountability. You, you guys can flame us in a thousand different ways publicly. I mean, everything we say is recorded for posterity. So if you make a mistake, you have to own that mistake. So often, I read about this in my book, it's probably the most controversial chapter, it's about Cronkite, because yeah, so yeah. much, so much of the time, people will say, well, Cronkite will be rolling over in his grave if he saw the way you're doing journalism. And, and there came a point where I got so frustrated by this that I picked up Douglas Brinkley's book on Cronkite, this giant tome, and Cronkite made some pretty spectacular mistakes uh, during his career. They're just but not- pre-internet and pre-Twitter, yeah, right? not <laughs> remembered. He helped bug the RNC. Like, literally, his producer and him had a wire listening into a room where members of the Republican Party were talking about strategy, that, that wire went into his ear and he was reporting on it. That, you, that's breaking the law now. I mean, imagine if I did that, it would never work again. So he's done amazing journalism. It's not to say that I don't think Walter Cronkite is a legend and deservedly so, but there were mistakes made when they were trying to figure out this thing called television journalism and the point is that today we have so much more oversight, public oversight into what we do, that we just have to, by nature of the, the world we live in, do a better job. I mean, to me, it's, it's the dehumanization when Trump and others who begin to parrot the idea of the media, you stop thinking about us as people and you start thinking about us as like this evil cabal akin to the deep state. And I think that's where things get dangerous. And, and you know, you and I and all of us, we were all on the road in 2016 together and, and in 20, and I would talk to voters at Trump rallies everywhere I went, and they would, you know, I'd say, hey, I'm Allie with NBC, and they'd be like, oh, we hate NBC. And I'd be like, all right, well, talk to me anyway. By the end of the conversation, they'd be like, you're one of the good ones. Yeah. And I'd be like, no, I'm just one of the ones. Like, we all ask the questions, we all wanna know why you're here, we're all trying to just understand. And to me, then they would, you know, watch Trump on stage and be like, you're fake news. And they would turn around and some of them would be like, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and then others would be like, yeah, just kidding. And it's like, or just don't do that. But the yeah. dehumanization is, I think, it's the part not that the, makes It's it not scary. the majority of the people. It's the one, it's the yeah. one person out there who Correct. doesn't, who's not in on the joke, doesn't understand what's going on and takes it too seriously. I and know. has been emboldened. Yeah. yeah. I know we have to get to questions. I, I, I'm pretty critical about what we do and how we frame stories and... I could go on and I won't, but it's part of why I wrote my last book. But I do think one thing that's different is that um, if you just look at what Speaker Kevin McCarthy has done with the January 6th footage, yeah. on uh, January 6th, Speaker McCarthy talked about the violent mob that Donald Trump was responsible for. 
So, and if you hear him, Nora O'Donnell interviewed him on the, on the 6th of January, and his voice was shaking from the violence. And he is now essentially put in play the, the relitigation, the recreation of a narrative, a story about January 6th, that it wasn't a violent event. That's not a disagreement over, um, that we've, that's not in the normal realm of disagreements. That's creating an entirely new set of facts that the person who's trying to create the new set of facts is on the record saying the exact opposite. That's, that's new, and the reason that matters is that if there's a world in which people can, can create entirely new stories, often the new stories they create are that the people trying to tell you in their own fumbling, shambling, incredibly imperfect way, trying to tell you a different story based on a set of facts, that they're not just wrong, they're evil, and the evil that they're perpetrating is to make your life worse and the generational uh, transfer to your children even worse. And that's where it gets mm -hmm. really toxic and dangerous. Let me go to some questions. Can you introduce yourself and let us know what your question is? Sure. Uh, my name is Maureen O'Brien. Um, first, I would like to say, Ali, my wife and I will also watch The Bachelor, so. Yeah. This season's <laughs> terrible, but yeah. <laughs> yes. um, the question I have is, um, uh, things that we've heard multiple times today is that Donald Trump is likely to get the nomination. Um, and, uh, just as insiders, uh, are there any insights you can share to assuage the fear that I have over that or the concern that we have over another round of Donald Trump? <laughs> I guess there, there could be so many indictments that it finally, I mean, if it's, if it's the Justice Department, Fulton County, and New York City, uh, that could perhaps, but it, it, could, it, it could, could also be. double his yeah, poll numbers. Right. I think you should prepare yourself for Donald Trump to be the nominee. Okay, okay this, is a, this is a hypothetical. Okay, everybody's talking about how old is Trump and how old is Biden. Okay, what happens if, like, right before the nomination for the Republican Party, Trump dies of a heart attack or some, something? He dies. Okay, no, no. who becomes who become no. the nominee at that time? And if that person becomes the nominee, and all of a sudden, Biden, before, after the convention, he, he gets the nomination, and he dies. Does Kamala Harris automatically become the running? John, for, are you, you've Kate, got to be yeah, the expert just, on this, right? Is somebody attached to this screenplay? <laughs> um. <laughs> no, but it's a possibility, right? I feel like we're on that Saturday Night Live no, no. episode with Cheryl Ford and, and the bear. It's just, it's just going to be weekend at Bernie's. They're going to yeah. prop him up. Yeah. I don't know. Katie don't will know need idea. another edition of her campaign book called Craziest Campaign Ever, right? Deadliest yeah. Campaign Ever. Um, I don't know. Any of you want to, want to take the... the uh, is it second place, John, in the convention? Who gets it? Hypothetical. If it's, if it's second place? I mean, if they both the die, is it second place in the convention? Or, it, or, or would, they chose to be would they have to reconvene well, how, how a, um, what happens? a nominating convention? Tell know. us, John. I don't yeah. know. Oh, my God. <laughs> Damn it, last night, if I'd only known to study the Democratic nominating rules for the second. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what, how that would happen. They would probably, I think the, well, I don't know. I'm not even going to get I guess it would depend if it was Biden, you'd have a succession issue. So it would be Kamala right. Harris as president. Right. Then she and might then she default. would be the incumbent. She might be default to the incumbent. I mean, look at Veep but when the president resigned. There we go. So it's never good when you say look at What would happen Veep. in the Republican? <laughs> what would happen with the Republican? I don't know. I wish I had an answer for you. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't remember their nominee. You'd, I, you'd, I'll have to Google after this. Because, <laughs> Thank you. because you wouldn't have, it would be a huge credential fight yeah, yeah, yeah. for whoever they decided to try to pick as the second. And then, yeah. oh man. I, next, yeah. next year we'll have an entire um, session on what if, and we'll just play out every scenario. I Could be it. fun, right? Okay, go ahead. Uh, my name's Maddie. I graduated from Tulane in December. So roll wave. Congrats. At Roll Wave. I'm the younger voter base in the audience today and at Bookfest in general. Um, and I was just wondering if you could touch on the youth as voters, because I've only been able, as 22 years old, to vote in one presidential election, and a lot of people who weren't able to vote in that election are now able to vote, and there's often a lot of conversation about, oh, the youth, they're making these changes, the waves are coming, but I was an English and sociology major here, and we studied a lot of things that kind of pointed to the fact that it's not as big of a change, I think, as people want to believe that it is. Mm -hmm. So I'm just kind of curious about your perspectives on whether that 
that wave that's coming of the youth is going to make a difference or not. What, what motivates you to want to be involved in politics? Um, I was raised in a split politics household. Mm -hmm. My mom's mm. here. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but my dad was a traditional conservative who de-affiliated with the party when Trump was elected and yeah. chose to re-affiliate as an independent. So politics, I'm also from D.C., kind of has been a part of my life. And I just think it's interesting to hear people's commentary when they say the youth, the youth, the youth. But it's not necessarily what I see, especially coming from D.C. to Louisiana. It's different, a different place, different perspectives. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's always hopeful that the youth vote will get out and change. And, and each party tries to harness it. Democrats maybe more so than the Republicans. Um, and some years they're more successful than others. It depends on the candidate. Um, Ali, you're the resident young person on this panel. I'm a millennial. I aged out. I don't even talk to TikTok or whatever. Talk ticks. I don't know. So, fine. And she's the Tulane alum. And I'm the Tulane alum, so yeah. I will take that. There you go. So, look, I mean, yeah, give it up for Tulane. Uh, yes. Amazing school choice. Fantastic. Love this Thank for you. you. Um, look, I. I think that Katie's right when you talk about the ways that if youth voters were to actually turn out in the numbers that the parties hope that they would, things would change immensely. I do think, though, that what we're starting to see in Congress is younger members, when you talk about the age issues that are happening Brandon right Maxwell. now. With, right. Exactly. When you have Maxwell Frost, when you have... Maxwell um, Frost, thank you. When, right. But, but when you have all of these younger folks, what I've actually heard from many of them, and I'm not just saying younger because, you know, Maxwell Frost is the youngest. I'm talking about, like, the ones in their 30s and 40s. Many of them say to me, I actually find that those are the people who I can find commonality with. You know, Sarah Jacobs is a Democrat, and she's found many people on the Republican side who she feels on foreign policy she can deal with. I think age is a factor when you're thinking about your electeds, that can also help to influence change. Change does not ever come quickly. Doesn't matter how many people turn out. We have a system that's just slow. And it's not immediately reactive and it was built that way. But at the same time, when you see systemic change and the pipeline just looks fuller and more reflective, I think that's when you start to see the kind of change that you're talking about and it comes from wider engagement. Thank you. Good. Yeah, next question. Hello, I'm Leo. I'm a freshman at Tulane. And um, my question was, I know that a lot of people are looking at the upcoming legislative session in the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. And when Governor DeSantis was asked about it, he replied, quote, you ain't seen nothing yet. So what sort of policies do you think that he would bring and that he might run on in 2024? So it's interesting, the legislative session that's coming up is going to extend the, you know, like the don't say gay bill. Mm -hmm. Um, make it so that I believe you can't talk about gender or sexuality through eighth grade officially in, in the paperwork. Um, he wants to continue those, those more extreme cultural policies that he's run on, just making them more stringent, and then also potentially rolling back uh, the abortion ban to six weeks instead of 15 weeks where he's at right now, which might be problematic for him in a general election. I think you look to the legislative session and what they end up passing, and remember this is basically a rubber stamp legislature for him in Florida, as what he will be running on. That is his de facto platform mm -hmm. for 2024, which is why I asked the question, is that a platform that is winning for a general election when we've seen so many voters reject those sorts of policies? Thank you so much. Okay, we've got time for one more quick question. Yes, ma'am. I'm not sure how quick it is. Well, it's got to be. We got one minute and fifteen seconds, and we're TV people up here. There's so a guy we know how to read a countdown clock. Okay. Too. Well, I have a background in television, so I'll take a try at it. Yeah. Um, essentially, I want to know if any of you uh, share my concern and anger with the media for a totally different reason than most people have, and that is that you guys have given so much coverage to these creeps that we are in a world that we shouldn't have been in. And you're doing it partially because your owners love the business that they're getting mm -hmm. from giving so much exposure to people like Trump. And I just want to point out that I worked in politics with Bobby Kennedy and George McGovern and people like that. And we never got a speech at a rally covered from beginning to end. And you guys have been doing that. So do you share at all my concern and anger with your role in promoting these people? I, I think 2016 was a learning lesson for all yeah. of us. And when I say we make mistakes, that was a mistake that the, the media industry made in covering Donald Trump the way we did from start to finish and then trying to wrap some 
facts uh, checking around it. It didn't really work. Um, I, I don't think the media is to blame for Donald Trump being the president of the United States. I reject that, although I do think we made mistakes. Um, I think we, as an industry, are trying to learn from those mistakes and not repeat them again. All right, well, I think we're going to leave it there. So, sorry, sir, we are out of time. Um, quick one, quick one, and interesting. If we got, all right, go, 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 quick. Are you going to give me the hook or not? Okay, go ahead. Uh, what, would, what do you think will be the impact of the recently divulged duplicity of some of the Fox newscasters? That could be a whole nother panel in and of itself, honestly. We're going to do well, the Dominion panel it does, outside. It doesn't help their legal position in the lawsuit, I'll tell you that. Correct. Um, I'm, not sure it hurt, I'm not sure that their viewership might not go up. They're also not covering it, right? So like, yeah, but it's I mean, not like right. the disrespect that they have for their own viewing base is being seen by their viewing base. But like, and your viewing base is still in their silo. Correct. So are the, they? the question is, does a, does a jury, in addition to a financial penalty, if it gets that yeah. far, or if there's a settlement, does that settlement include some sort of clause that says you have to go on air and admit that you lied? And what that language might look like? I'm not sure if legally, I mean, there's questions about the legality of whether that would hold up, given that it's a news organization, although I think it's up for discussion whether it's a news organization. Um, but I think that would be, if that were included and did make it through, that would potentially be damaging, but short of that, except, I'm not sure. Except imagine that happened. One of the personalities would say, you know, these unelected yeah. judges yeah. trying to, you know, crimp our First yeah. Amendment, Cancel and then by go. like 10 yeah. minutes yeah. later, it would have been bygones. All right, well, I want to thank our panelists um, <laughs> for joining us. And um, check out all of their terrific books. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Please join Katie.